Good evening everybody. Welcome to uh, Mixed Britain's Winter Astronomical Society's Zoominar. Give us all a wave. This evening we're welcoming Mike Fawkes from um, is it Hertfordshire? Bedfordshire actually. Sorry Bedfordshire. Near? In Henlow in Bedfordshire. I know it was somewhere down there. It's somewhere down, down south unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Mike is the director of the British Astro Astronomical Association Saturn, Uranus and Neptune section. He's also on the committee of the BAA's Jupiter section. He's been interested in astronomy since a young age. He is an active observer, particularly of the moon and the planets. For many years, he's given various talks to amateur astronomy societies and also participates the BAA back to basic courses which are aimed at beginners in amateur astronomy. He's recently retired from working, good lad, glad to hear it. Yeah, so am I. <laughs> uh, from working in the spacecraft industry which it could probably be a talk in itself. Yeah maybe. maybe. So thank you very much Michael and if everybody can uh, join me in giving him a Mixed Winter Swinton welcome. Thank, thank you. you, thank you, thank you. If I may just share my screen first off. Can everybody see the slide? Yeah, you, you are broadcasting and I've got four beautiful pictures of Saturn with the title Saturn. Excellent, excellent. So uh, we might as well begin. Well, first of all, it's very kind to be invited to talk to our society this evening. Um, and it's also good to see a few familiar faces as well. I mean, I know some people go to the Holland Castle Astronomy Weekend and I've seen Mick, I can see Roy, Gary and Tony and we do go back quite a way through that meeting so it's good to see them and it goes without saying that I would much rather be doing this in person uh, particularly as I've heard from many people that your meetings are very lively and very exciting so I would have loved to have been in there in person but alas the dreaded virus has got in the way and it seems to have screwed everything up and on that topic I hope everybody is keeping safe and well and hopefully now the vaccine is starting to be rolled out hopefully have meetings uh, in person again but I suppose we are very lucky that we've got technology like Zoom that allows societies to keep on going in some shape or form. So tonight um, I'll start now and I suppose for and there's so, if you get interested in astronomy, particularly observing, there's so many fantastic guidebooks out there uh, that show you how to go out and look in the night sky and start to observe it. And often as not, they identify, I hate using the expression, but must see objects in the sky. Obviously one is the moon, which even with a small telescope block, you can see quite a few things. Pleiades are always good through per binoculars, large telescope, and the list goes on and on of nice objects to look at. And amongst this list of must-see objects is the topic of what I'm going to talk about tonight, the planet Saturn. Why Saturn? Well, I suppose that's a rhetorical question for an audience of themselves, because we all know why Saturn. It's surrounded by this rather splendid system of rings. Now, if anybody had been given a talk pre-1977, they might have said Saturn and its unique ring system. But since that time and the discovery of the rings of Uranus, we now know that ring phenomena is quite a common occurrence. All the giant planets have got rings in themselves. But where Saturn still has a semblance of being unique, it's the one ring system that can be readily seen with the slightest of optical aid. It's, it's fairly easy to do, a small telescope would do it. And I'm not saying it's the most spectacular object in the side by any means, but it's certainly well worth one looking at. So tonight what I'm going to do is give a very brief overview of the Saturn system and because it's such a big planet and there's so many things about it to discuss Saturn's system in its entirety would take many many talks. So what I'm going to do is just give a brief overview and in particular look obviously at the rings and also the planet but in particular looking at features in the planet's atmosphere. And if there's a little bit of time, I'll briefly mention the satellites and also an event that's going to take place on the 21st of December this year, which involves Saturn. If we're going to start anywhere, like many astronomical talks, start with this guy, 
Galileo Galilei lived in what we call modern day Italy, uh, became a professor of mathematics at various northern Italian universities. He was arguably the first great experimentalist. He did a lot of work in mechanics. And although he didn't invent the telescope, and although he may not have even been the first person to turn a telescope to the sky, in 1609-1608, he made some incredibly groundbreaking discoveries with various telescopes, even though by modern day standards, they were very crude. Picked up the craters of the moon, stars of the Milky Way. And one object he looked at was Jupiter. And he found that Jupiter was accompanied by up to four star-like objects that seemed to keep pace with Jupiter as it moved around the sky and also seemed to move either side of the planet. We now know these as the, the four largest satellites of Jupiter, Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto, and we see their orbits effectively in their plane, that's why they seem to shuttle either side of the planet. Galileo, probably trying to curry a bit of favour with the all-powerful Medici family, named them the Medici stars, but we now know them collectively as the Galilean satellites. So perhaps when he turned his telescope to Saturn, probably not unsurprisingly, he found that this too was a multiple object. There seemed to be a large disc surrounded with two smaller discs either side. But unlike the objects with Saturn, that move, uh, Jupiter, which moved, these two objects either side of Saturn stubbornly refused to move night after night. And in fact, a couple of years after Galileo discovered them, they actually disappeared, which probably caused him some consternation, but he seemed to have had a bit of bravado and said they would reappear again, which they duly did. But in his crude telescope, he couldn't really work out what they were. And in fact, he discovered the rings of Saturn unknowingly. And what he was seeing was the widest points of the rings as projected on the sky, but his telescopes weren't enabled to resolve them any further. Although some people disputed his observations, when telescopes became more prevalent, many people looked at Saturn. And here's a selection of drawings made in sort of 1610, 1620 and so on. Some of which show Saturn as we might reckon, uh, find them to look like today, and others looked a little bit weird. And deciding what these things were caused a lot of astronomers a great deal of consternation. Many theories were proposed. Um, some people argue that Saturn was like what we call the modern day football, rugby football with markings on it. Some people thought it was gases or vapours coming off the planet. The great Sir Christopher Wren, who we all know who designed fantastic buildings such as St Paul's Cathedral, was an astronomer in his own right. And he came up with a theory which was sort of like coronal arcs around the planet. But the true recognition of what we were looking at observationally then came by one of the great Flemish astronomers, Christian Huygens. And for the Horncastle goers, I'm not even going to mention Sid Huygens' jokes. Christian Huygens actually um, discovered Saturn's largest satellite, Titan, and based on its orbit around the planet, he eventually came to the idea of what we were really looking at. And he came up with three ideas, that Saturn was actually surrounded by a ring. It nowhere touches the planet, so it's separate from the planet. And this ring is inclined to the plane of Saturn's orbit. And this is a modern day drawing, it's one of my own, of what his diagram was in his book, The System Saturnium. And though his explanation doesn't say what the ring actually is, it describes it what it is from an observational point of view. And here we see the sun and the earth and not to scale Saturn's orbit. And the rings uh, lie in the plane of Saturn's equator. And because the pole is inclined by nearly 27 degrees to its orbit, as it moves around, on one side of its orbit, its north pole is presented towards the sun. And on the other side, the South Pole is presented towards the Sun. And at very roughly 13 and a bit years and 15 years, the poles are perpendicular to our line of sight and the rings will appear edge on. And so this, as Saturn moves around in its orbit, taking just over 29 years, this accounts for the varying appearance of Saturn's rings. It's purely an observational point of view. It's nothing physical going on with the ring system. As an aside, when the rings are edge on, last occurred in 2009 and then again in 2025, 
although the rings are very difficult to see at that time, we'll see a little bit later on, it's actually one of the more interesting times for observers of Saturn. And then, uh, then we'll get a sort of uh, southern hemisphere towards us again, and then in 2039 the rings will be edge on again. So when we look, um, all the knowledge that we've gained since the discovery of the rings has been done by Earth-based uh, telescopes and um, even the Hubble looks at Saturn and hopefully when and if it ever gets launched the uh, new space telescope will be able to look at Saturn as well. A lot of our knowledge has come from spacecraft and certainly so far there's been four spacecraft to Saturn, three flybys, Pioneer 11, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. But then an orbiting spacecraft, Cassini, or perhaps give its more proper name, Cassini Huygens, which was launched in 1977. This was an absolutely superb mission, carried an orbiter, the Cassini spacecraft, and the Huygens lander, which was named after Christian Huygens, and this landed on Titan. And although the initial mission was only supposed to be a few years, it got extended. And so there's so much information that's come from the Cassini spacecraft, it'll keep scientists going on forever more. But if we look through even a small telescope, we can see the rings. I mean, high power binoculars or maybe a sort of 30 mil refractor would show the rings. And if you're lucky enough to have a big telescope, then it is a rather magnificent sight. And with reasonable sized telescopes, and if the scene is good, there are three main groupings of rings that we can see in amateur instruments. There's an outer darker ring, which is called ring A. The brighter inner ring, which slowly fades off in brightness towards the centre, which is ring B. And then there's a very, very faint ring, ring C. Now, this system is huge. It's sort of 270,000 kilometres across. And having something of that size, is, it does get difficult to imagine. So if we could pluck Saturn and this, the main rings out of its orbit and put it on the Earth, this distance between this tip of the rings and that, oops, sorry, I've touched the wrong thing, would actually stretch nearly point, uh, sort of 70 percent the distance between the Earth and the Moon. So it is a huge structure. And we'll see very shortly that the rings are actually more extensive than this. So the size of them is enormous, but what I find fascinating is although they're huge radially, in terms of thickness, they're actually very, very, very thin indeed. And estimates initially used to be just a few kilometres thick. And now modern day estimates suggest that the ring system is, on average, a few tens of metres thick, though in some places it is thicker. And this is something I'll come back to a little bit later on. The early observers just saw one ring, but it was in a, a number of years after the rings were discovered, this astronomer made a, an important discovery. It was an Italian astronomer called Gian Domenica Cassini, but he then went to the dark side of the force or was dis uh, seduced by the dark side of the force by moving to France of all places and became a director of the Paris Observatory, the equivalent of the Greenwich Observatory. And he actually changed his, his forenames from the Italian to the French, so he's more better known as Jean Dominique Cassini. And he founded an astronomical dynasty in France with several Cassinis, his sons, and so on. And indeed, if you go to Paris, or if we could go to Paris now, but we can't because of the, the, the virus, the Paris Observatory actually lies on Rue de Cassini. And with one of his small telescopes, he made an important discovery, he found that there was actually a dark marking on the ring system. He suspected it was a division, but he had no re means of proving this. And he also was one of the first people to see some markings on the planet. Proving that this was actually a true division had to wait for many centuries. And uh, even the great William Herschel observed Saturn quite a lot. He observed the north face of the rings and the south face of the rings and measured the position of this dark marking and the, the positions match. So he did suspect it was actually some sort of gap in the ring system. But the, the actual proof that this was a, or semi-proof, that this was actually a true division had to wait until a number of years later in 1917, when two British amateurs, uh, uh, Captain Ainsley and Mr Knight, uh, respectively using a nine inch reflector and a five inch refractor, observed Saturn pass in front of a star, an occultation. 
And as they observed, they found that the star, uh, the path, this is the path of the star through the as seen against the rings. It actually disappeared um, or started to fade when it went through ring A, which it never completely disappeared, which first of all gave the idea that the rings were translucent. But when the star was actually reached the Cassini division, it flared back up in almost the same brilliance. And this gave the idea that it is actually a gap in the ring system. But we'll see very shortly that um, there, are, there is material actually in the Cassini division. Occultations of stars by Saturn's rings are relatively rare. But this shows a drawing by a British amateur, David Gray, who lives up in the northeast. And this was one in 2006. And this really mimicked the observation by Ainsley and Knight. And this is a variable star, B.Y. Cancri, and the Saturn's rings passed in front of that. And like every few years we get an occultation. You can see that the star is relatively easily visible through Cassini's division. So by that time, we had two divisions of the rings, ring A and ring B. The third ring that is visible to amateurs is ring C. It wasn't discovered until the 1850s which is quite surprising. And the discovery was made by the father and son team, William Bond and GP Bond, using the 15 inch telescope at Harvard University. And they actually found that there was this sort of marking inside, which was actually ring C. Nowadays, if anybody makes a discovery within seconds, it's on the internet, there's emails and so on. But it was effectively also discovered by this gentleman, the legendary William Rutter Dawes, an absolutely eagle-eyed Dawes, he got the nickname because he was a good visual observer. And unlike the Bonds who used a 15-inch telescope, Dawes found this a couple of weeks later using just a six-inch or six-and-a-bit-inch refractor. And this is his drawing, which shows uh, the, the inner ring C, which became designated in fact, he was a good friend of another great British observer, William Lassell, who used very large telescopes, specular mirror telescopes, and he actually coined the name the Crepe Ring. And it is a bit surprising that this ring took so many years to discover because William Herschel was an avid observer, oh, sorry, ob observer of Saturn. It was one of his favourite objects. And although he could see what turned out to be where the ring C is projected against the planet. He never suspected it actually existed in this gap in the rings. And he always thought this was one of the belts. So why it took so long for people to see ring C, I honestly don't know. Some people suggested a change in intensity, but I don't think that's the case. I think it was just people never suspected it. But they're the main three rings, but Saturn's ring system is even more extensive and from spacecraft and some Earth-based observations have found some incredible rings. And this is an image looking back towards the sun taken by Cassini, so it's looking on the dark side of the planet and it's looking, it's a long exposure for the faint rings and a shorter exposure for the main rings and it's seeing the rings in forward scattered light and it picks up several more rings. There's a very faint F ring here, which is a very narrow ring just outside ring A. There's a very narrow and incredibly faint G ring. And then there's a very amorphous E ring that surrounds the Saturn system. And the tip of this, it makes the ring system two, three times bigger than the main ring system that we see. Also inside the ring system, there's a, a very faint D ring system, which Cassini indicates some of the particles are actually now starting to shed into Saturn's atmosphere. But the ring system doesn't even stop there, because one of Saturn's fainter satellites, satellite Phoebe, which lies at, I don't know, 100, 150 radii from Saturn, material is coming off that. And it was in 2009, the Spitzer telescope discovered this incredibly faint ring. It's way, way, way out on the system that we see. And it's also inclined to the plane of this ring system. So Saturn's rings are very varied and also very, very extensive. But what actually are the rings themselves? What causes them? How have they formed? Well, when the rings were first identified post Christian Huygens, I think many people thought it was a solid sheet surrounding Saturn. But then it became that the great French mathematician, a great 
um, celestial dynamicist, uh, Pierre Simon Laplace, did a lot of calculations using Newton's laws of motion and felt that a solid ring just could not exist. It would be broken up very quickly because of gravitational effects. So he actually proposed a very convoluted system of solid rings that were incredibly narrow, like sort of rings on a gramophone record all surrounded each other. Some moving, some more elliptical than others. And this spawned a, a look for divisions in the ring. There were many people looked for divisions. But then later on, they, they, the people re-examined the mechanics of this and said such rings would, like a solid ring, would break up under gravitational forwards. A fluid hypothesis was briefly supposed, but it wasn't until the mid 19th century, the great British physicist, James Clark Maxwell of uh, electromagnetism laws fame, came up with the right solution. And he proposed that the rings were made up of countless billions of bodies of various sides. So basically Saturn has got zillions of satellites going around it. Some of these could be as small as micrometeorites, some could be as small as, as big as a small house all going around each other following Kepler's laws of planetary motion. And it was a few decades later that an American astronomer, uh, an astronomer called um, Keeler, uh, actually put a spectroscope uh, across Saturn's rings and measured the velocity. And because of this spectroscope, he, 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 he found that the inner bits was rotated much faster than the outer bits, which is what we expect by millions of objects orbiting Saturn. So Saturn's rings are made of lots and lots and lots of particles and the features we see them are basically down to gravitational interaction of some form or another. One of the things is that numerous gaps have been found in particularly in the C-ring and there's also a gap here as well and there's an even fainter true gap out here. Um, the even the larger telescopes and spacecraft, sorry, I keep hitting the wrong button, um, have shown that the Cassini division actually has got material in it. So it's not completely free of material. But when people started looking for gaps in the rings, people thought that this was actually this division between a bright part of the ring A and a darker part was actually a true division. And this was discovered by Johann Enke of Enke's Comet fame. In fact, it's not a true division, a true division, it's a contrast effect. And this division here uh, was discovered by Keeler. But ironically, uh, the International Astronomical Unit gave this name, even though it was discovered by Keeler, gave it the name of the Enker Gap. And it was a fainter division out here, which we can't see on this image, but we'll see on some other images, has been allocated the Keeler Gap. But what causes these gaps and all this when high resolution images of the rings have been taken look like sort of lots of ringlets inside each other is a matter of great debate but it all boils down to gravity. Some of these gaps are produced by very small satellites inside these divisions. There's, there's a, a very both the Keeler and the, the Enker divisions have got tiny tiny satellites inside them that are clearing the material around them. Some of these gaps and uh, features in the rings are caused by gravitational resonances. These particles are under the gravitational influence of Saturn and all the other satellites and so the satellite forces on them are varying but on the edge of the Cassini division one rotation or two rotations of the Cassini division mimic one rotation of a new satellite called Mimas and so every couple of rotations it gets a preferential tug so these resonances actually help clear some of the material out and form some of the things we see in the rings. But even then, the, the so-called like multi-ring pictures we get, as we see from like the Cassini spacecraft, are thought to be not one ring inside the other, but actually density waves where the satellites are making the particles bunch up and then uh, disperse again as well. Outside of um, the... Uh, a ring there's the famous F ring a very narrow ring which was discovered by Voyager and at the time it showed all sorts of braiding um, very unusual and perhaps the scientists jumped dumb a little bit and thought that the laws of physics as we know and don't apply here and it was a complete mistake to say that because they subsequently found that there was two satellites either side of this ring Prometheus and Pandora 
And scientists that do gravitational modeling think that these two satellites help constrain the particles together to form a narrow ring. But more modern work thinks it may only be down to uh, Pandora now. So there's a lot of things going on. And so um, that's the main sim ring system. But some of the other ring systems, such as the Phoebe ring, are thought to be formed by particles hitting Phoebe and then bouncing off the satellite and going into orbit. Enceladus ring, the E is formed by the E ring is formed by satellite Enceladus, and I'll talk about that a little bit briefly. And there's also a satellite called Aegeon, if I pronounce it correctly, which if its meteorites are hitting this satellite, materials coming off which may form the G ring. And here is the F ring with the satellite Prometheus shown on it, which shows this sort of braiding structure that I mentioned earlier. And here is the anchor gap with the satellite that's causing this gap, Pan. And then there's the Daphnis, which sits inside the Keeler gap, which sweeps out the material inside this thing. So the, although gravity force, as for Newton's laws of gravity, are very, very simple, this complex interaction between the particles, the satellites, the planet, and possibly magnetic fields as well, making this thing, this beautiful thing, which is Saturn's ring system. They're also quite dynamic. And one interesting observation came from Cassini way back in 2013, that showed what may be a clumping of some material in ring A, whether this was just random and only lasted a few days, or maybe something was trying to form and then get disrupted again by gravity, nobody really knows. But the rings are actually a very dynamic environment. And indeed, some of the Cassini results have shown waves inside the ring, ring C, and many scientists believe that some sort of asteroid or comet may have passed through the ring, disturbing it. So it's a very, very dynamic place, the rings. I mentioned earlier that sometimes the rings appear edge-on, and it's quite an interesting time. Depending upon the geometry and when the, the, the edge-on phase occurs, we sometimes can actually get the dark side of the rings presented towards us. And you think that wouldn't be visible from the Earth, but actually it appears as a sort of faint gossamer-like narrow ring system with perhaps some of the satellites projected onto it. And this is caused by sunlight filtering through the rings and also light coming off the planet reflected back off the rings. But sometimes the rings seem to disappear, uh, like we see with this observation by Dave Graham, again another northeastern astronomer, using one of the Lick telescopes. He was an amateur, got, got permission to use the Lick, 40, uh, Lick refractor. And within a few hours, we can see that between August the 10th and August the 11th in 1995, the rings weren't visible and a few hours later they reappeared with sunlight coming on them. But Cassini was in orbit around the planet when the rings were edge on in 2009. And this interesting photograph shows part of ring B. And I mentioned the rings are thin in many places, but this shows material which is actually casting shadows across the rings. These features may be clumps of ring material, icy material, um, elevated by maybe a couple of kilometers. And this is thought due to the fact that some of the inner satellites uh, orbiting Saturn don't quite lie in the same plane as the rings. And the gravitational interaction is just pulling material a little bit out of the ring plane and producing these wonderful sort of almost like mountains in the ring system. So the rings that we see, there's a lot going on with them. We can't just spend time talking about the rings, and I'd now like to just switch slightly and talk about the big object that lies in the centre of the rings, the planet itself. And often as not, um, the rings, when we look at Saturn, the rings dominate and the planet does get forgotten, but it is actually an interesting object in its own right. We will see time and time again in this talk that Saturn has a lot of similarity with the planet Jupiter, it's big, it's massive, it's, um, it's got features in its atmosphere that resemble those on Jupiter. And its orbit lies roughly between nine and 10 astronomical units away from the sun. That's nine or 10 times the distance between the Earth and the sun. And it takes just over 29 years to go round. And it's certainly for the ancient astronomers, it was the slowest moving planet they could detect. It's a big object. Um, its radius is over 60,000 kilometers, so it's the second largest planet in our solar system. 
But because it has quite a rapid rotation, um, it's suspected the inner core of the inner part of the planet takes just over 10 and a half hours to rotate. It's, it's made up of a lot of gas, so it's very, very flattened indeed. It's, quite, it's the most flattened of the planet because of its rapid rotation and low density. Although we don't normally see this until when the rings are very near the edge on, where we can see both hemispheres. Though it's the second largest planet, 95 times the mass of the Earth, it's still, a, although it's similar in size to Jupiter in mass terms, it's about a third. Jupiter is over 318, 20 times the mass of the Earth. So compared to Jupiter in mass terms, it's, it's a lot smaller. When we look at the planet, what we're seeing is the top of what is a very dense and deep atmosphere, which is very akin to solar compositions. A lot of hydrogen and a lot of helium inside the planet and trace elements um, like methane, ammonia, hydrosulfide. And based on the best knowledge of the physics of gases under high pressure and how the planet rotates, the best idea of what lies beneath the atmosphere, which we can't see, is that it's basically a big gas bag. That's the only way you can describe it. There's a lot of hydrogen, which probably gets compressed as we go deeper down, very thousands upon thousands of atmospheres pressure. And at that pressure, the, the, the hydrogen starts to lose its electrons and start to behave as a metal. So it's either a solid or a liquid metal. And a lot of scientists think there's probably a, a, a rocky core at the centre of the planet, maybe several times the mass of the Earth, but we don't know for certain. But this is the best idea of what we think is, is below the atmosphere of Saturn. Its upper atmosphere is um, interesting as well. And these are sort of results from the, the, the spacecraft that believes that unlike Jupiter, there's a lot more haze in its upper atmosphere. And then it's layered, we get layers of ammonia ice inside the hydrogen, and then another layer of ammonia hydrosulfide, and probably deeper, there's water. Now, it's late at night, and I can't honestly remember if water has actually been detected on Saturn. Certainly the theorists believe that there is water at a lower level, and the structure of this atmosphere is very similar to what we believe the upper layers of the atmosphere of um, Jupiter is. So here we can see the levels several hundred kilometres in terms of kilometres uh, and then there's, there's the pressure going down here with various um, uh, atmospheres. Also that they think that like on the Earth the atmosphere gets colder and colder and it's minus lots at the top of the troposphere. And then in the stratosphere the temperature starts to increase again, uh, not too dissimilar to the Earth. But it's also Saturn rotates, but not as a uniform body. And all our giant planets in the solar system all rotate quite rapidly. And all of them show very rapid winds in their upper atmosphere. On Jupiter, uh, the variation is about 100, 150 metres. So all the winds are blowing, sorry, I keep getting the wrong, blowing in the same direction, but some are slower than the others. And Jupiter seems to have these peaks and troughs of winds, uh, analogous to our jet streams. And some are very fast indeed. The equator has the fastest winds, but there's, nobody fully understands why the very fastest wind is in the northern hemisphere. Saturn too exhibits these sort of winds that vary with latitude, but it's by far the greatest wind speed variation. It's over nearly, nearly 400 metres, 500 metres compared to the others. And the other planets also show rapid variations in wind speed in varying in latitude. Why this is, we're not sure, but certainly for Jupiter and Saturn and Neptune, they emit far more energy from their interiors than they receive from the Sun. Uh, for Saturn, it's about two and a half times the amount of energy. So although the tops of the atmosphere are very cold, minus 180 degrees centigrade, something like that. The, these Jupiter and Saturn are radiating a lot more energy, and it's this energy that just drives the sort of meteorological features we see in its upper atmosphere. And if we compare Jupiter and Saturn in terms of features, if we look through a telescope, Jupiter has these alternating bright and dark bands, if you will, that run parallel to the equator. 
Um, the, the dark bands are called belts and the lighter regions are called zones. Um, this is um, just ancient terminology that we have. But here's four images of Jupiter taken uh, several years apart and they show that the atmosphere is quite dynamic. We have the great red spot that does vary in intensity from time to time. We get other storm features. Here we see a smaller red spot, for example. And sometimes some of these belts appear very dark, sometimes they're faint, and other storm features come from time to time. So even with a small telescope and good seeing, there's always a lot of things to see on Jupiter's atmosphere. Now, if you look at these three images of Saturn taken when back in when the South Pole was tilted towards us, I'm sorry, I've got the old observer's tradition of south upwards here, and the North Pole is tilted towards you see that again exhibits these belts and zones, but whereas Jupiter's got the red spot and other features, even with large telescopes, Saturn looks, well, the guidebooks often say it looks bland. And that is a, a, an appearance that's been going on for years, but I'd like to show that actually Saturn too has quite a dynamic atmosphere. But why does Saturn appear so bland? Well, First of all, it's nearly twice as far away as Jupiter. Um, so it means that, to, uh, and it's also a little bit smaller. It's about 80% the diameter of Jupiter. So when we look at Saturn, say with a 150 mil telescope, um, and say look at Jupiter, for example, if we wanted to get the same sort of spatial resolution as we, a 150 millimeter telescope would show on Jupiter, we need something like a 320, 330 millimeter aperture telescope to get the same resolution. In fact, although these are not to scale, the Jupiter can get to about 45 arc seconds or a bit more at a typical opposition, where Saturn's disk is only about 18 or 20. So if I'd put these to scale, the disk of Saturn would be a lot, lot smaller. So that's the first thing. Secondly, um, because it's further away from the sun, uh, contrast levels are lower. And also, as we've seen earlier, there's a lot of haze in the upper atmosphere, which may hide features. So finding features on Saturn, atmospheric features, has always been difficult. But certainly over the last few years, the fact that we have imaging techniques now, the sort of webcams and digital cameras, means that many amateurs can now produce quite high resolution images of Saturn, which would have been unprecedented 20 or 30 years ago. And although many visual observations have started to pick up storms, there's a lot of storms now that are now being shown on amateur images, you know, 20 centimeter telescopes, 25 centimeter telescopes, which probably wouldn't have been detected unless you're using an incredibly large telescope. Over the years, many storm feats have been discovered, but when Cassini went in orbit around the planet, um, one of the first things it discovered was this bright storm. This has got south at the top, and this occurred in mid-temperate latitudes, and it got the nickname of the dragon storm, because it, in some formulation it looked like a sort of dragon. But these could be seen by amateurs. And this is a, a, an image of the same storm taken by British amateur Ian Sharp in the same year. And this could be detected by imaging by using just a, a 20 centimetre telescope. And this particular area of Saturn, this sort of mid-temperate latitude, seemed to produce a lot of storms over the subsequent years. Some were imaged by Cassini, here we see a new one. And over the subsequent years we had several of these storms appear at the same latitude. Here we've got one in 2008, we had two such of these storms. It's a very faint one shown in this drawing by David Gray. And there's another faint one shown in here by British amateur Peter Garbett. And these storms um, sort of would appear very bright. They would fade away. They would last several months and then there would be a gap and another storm would crop up. And our American cousins, because there were so many storms occurring at this latitude, called this Storm Alley. And nobody was really certain why these storms appeared at this particular latitude. But certainly one interesting thing that came out was from the Cassini spacecraft. And this is a diagram showing the layout of many of the instruments on, on, the, on the spacecraft. 
The one uh, in particular instrument is these long radio antennas, and it is the radio plasma wave subsystem. And this was originally designed to measure magnetic fields and radio emissions around Saturn. But they started picking up these bursts of energy that seemed to be appear whenever these storms were appear. And when they did the calculations, they found that these were the sort of frequencies they would expect from lightning bolts. So there was a great correlation. So these storms seem to be effectively thunderstorms, but sort of Earth-sized thunderstorms. And the radio emissions uh, got the name of Saturn Electrical Discharges, or SEDs. Not a great lover of acronyms. But every time, if I go back, one of these storms would appear, Cassini would pick up these radio emissions in, in indicating that these were actually violent thunderstorms. And thunderstorms are caused by violent convection. I say these are more massive than the storms, the thunderstorms we see on Earth. So there's a lot of thunderstorms going on with Saturn. But Saturn shows some other atmospheric features, but really big atmospheric features that could be readily seen by very small telescopes, or alas, rather rare. And one of the most famous is this one that occurred in 1933, a very bright storm in the equatorial regions, and it gradually started to spread around the planet. And it was discovered by William Hay, and I'm sure many of you remember he was a, a sort of musical and uh, cinema comedian. Um, some of his films on the comedy is a little bit dated now. You know, think of films like Goose Steps Out or Ask a Policeman, but one or two of the routines are still very funny. And he was a very avid amateur astronomer. And he discovered this spot using a six inch or 15 centimeter refractor. And I think this is the very telescope he used to discover this. But other storms of a similar nature have occurred over the years. And the most recent one occurred in 2010, 2011. It's alleged that Cassini actually imaged it, but I've looked at the December the 5th image where it's posted, and I can't obviously find something there. But about this date, the, the, the detector on the Cassini spacecraft started picking up the radio emissions that indicated thunderstorms again. And there was this bright spot appeared in Saturn's upper atmosphere, the northern hemisphere. And this image was taken by an Iranian amateur. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. But within, as you can see, within a couple of days, this spot started to brighten, started to become much, much larger. And this storm system started to move around the planet. In fact, it was so bright that in the early days of observing this, it was detected with sort of like an 80 millimeter, three inch refractor. It was that bright and that easy to see. Over the coming weeks, it was seen by Cassini, and this storm became larger and started to spread out in two branches of turbulence around the planet. And here is an image of Cassini taken on Christmas Eve, 2010. And this one is taken by uh, an American amateur, Jim Phillips, on, on Christmas Day, showing, and it does, this image compares very well to the Cassini image. And I think it proves that either Jim was a very enthusiastic amateur observing on Christmas Day, or more likely, American Christmas TV is just as dire as ours is. But you can see in these various observations, this storm is getting bigger and spreading around the planet. And this is an observation taken by a friend of mine, John Sussenbach in the Netherlands. And it was only using a five inch telescope. So it just shows how big and bright this storm was. Cassini imaged this when it actually, the disturbance has spread all around the planet. This is the original source and it caused a lot of turbulence in the planet's upper atmosphere. And the storm started to abate, but lots of dark features started to appear, vortices inside the planet's atmosphere as well, as shown by this image by Dave Tyler. This feature was moving at a different rate to uh, the, re the atmosphere at that latitude. And many physicists think that the, the um, faster moving winds going past this storm got churned up and distorted and this caused all this turbulence in the upper atmosphere. These are images of the source itself showing the, the disturbance and you can see that over periods of time this storm sort of sometimes bright and then it'd fade away then it'd come back bright again. 
But interestingly enough, as I said earlier, that the Cassini spacecraft measured the radio waves that indicated that this was a thunderstorm. But unlike the other storms I've shown earlier, which would last, the storms would be intermittent and last a few days, they had virtually continuous indication of thunderstorms for 250 days. So this was a massive thunderstorm indeed. And Cassini also imaged this close up and it's actually, you've got gas rising on a spinning body. So it started to spin very much like the great red spot or the hurricanes on the earth. So this was a really big hurricane like feature. But what causes, uh, sorry, uh, these storms occur every so often, and there's a rough correlation that they occur every Saturnian year. And the first sort of type of this really big storm is way back in 1876. There's another similar storm seen by the great British observer William Denning, and then there's Hay Spot, and then we had another one observed from the Pictomedia Observatory in 1960. One was observed in 1990. Uh, by damp professionals alike, and this shows this all the turbulence and disturbance in the upper atmosphere from the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is another image of the big storm that occurred in 2011. And this really begs the question why do they occur as such? Well, so far, six of these massive storms have occurred. And this, if we go back to this image just briefly. As this has got south up and north at the bottom, you'll notice that they all occur in the northern hemisphere. And they seem to alternate between the equatorial regions and the mid-temperate latitudes, equatorial regions, high latitudes, equatorial regions and mid-temperate latitudes. So nobody knows why there's this alternating pattern. Furthermore, as I said, they occur every Saturnian year. And this plot shows uh, dates along the side and this is days from the northern spring equinox and most of them are clustered in the autumn of the northern hemisphere. This one, the recent one in 2000, can, occurred in the spring and whether this is significant or not nobody really knows and in fact nobody's really sure how, how these storms come about. There's been modelling where they think that some sort of disturbance occurs lower in the atmosphere and then it punches further up its convective feature and punches up through the atmosphere and goes through the water layer and water is a great reservoir of energy and when it cools it gives off the heat which drives this even further higher. Very analogous to our thunderstorms, or sorry hurricanes on the earth. But what causes these disturbances to occur every Saturnian year is not really certain. There's various theories around, and I do not pretend in one instant to understand what these, how these come about. But it does seem to involve water and how the upper atmosphere cools, so that it cools sufficiently that convection can occur. But like I say, I don't fully understand them. But seeing one of these big storms, it, 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 it can be... Um, spectacular sight but when the next one will occur really might be in, a, in the next Saturn in year we don't really know. But the planet also has other storms on it. This image of in the northern hemisphere shows this dark vortex uh, seen by Cassini but even amateurs can image such features now. That's the vortex taken there by um, an Australian amateur Ray Johnson and over recent years there's been Various storms detected at various latitudes in the northern hemisphere is a sort of small bright one in the northern hemisphere and also uh, the resolution of some amateurs has got today now we actually see these waves appearing on the edges of some of these belts. So with modern telescopes and modern imaging it's possible for amateurs to actually detect quite relatively small features in Saturn's atmosphere. So earlier on I said the planet is bland, but nowadays we know there's more features occurring than we first thought. But one of the most interesting features in planet and Saturn's atmosphere is in the around the North Pole. And this feature was discovered by Voyager, and then when Cassini got there, the Northern Pole was hidden, so it could only image this feature in infrared. But by the time the North Pole came in sunlight, this is a visual observation of what is called the North Polar Hexagon. And it really does appear the sort of hexagonal structure. 
Again, what causes this is not fully understood, but it's thought to be that the winds at that latitude, for some reason on Saturn, produce sort of waves, standing waves, where there's waves in the same position. And we get this sort of hexagonal structure. It's actually quite big, um, 26 to 30,000 kilometers across. These are about 12,000 kilometers. So in a telescope, this would correspond to a typical Saturn observation to about four arc seconds across on a disk that may be 18 to 20 arc seconds across. So perhaps this dark feature of the hexagon could be visible in amateur telescopes. But it was in 2013, I had an email from two Australian amateurs, Daryl Millican and Pat Nicholas, they work as a team, and they produced this image. And this is the first time I think amateurs have been able to actually image the vertices of the hexagon, which I think is phenomenal. And it just shows you again what amateurs with imaging capability can do. Not only that, they're showing the Cassini division, the Enca division, and lots of other divisions in the rings as well. But this was absolutely amazing observation of being able to see the North Polar hexagon. Whether this can be seen visually, I know of no observations of this. I think it'd have to be from the Southern Hemisphere because this was taken when the planet was very low from our latitude and they need a big telescope. But many, under the right conditions with reasonable seeing, many amateurs can image the hexagon now, which is quite astounding. In the last few minutes or so I've got, I'd like to talk very briefly about Saturn's satellites. Saturn has got 82 satellites now. It's always changing. When I first started out in astronomy, it only got nine. So it just shows how time has moved on. But some of these are readily visible in quite small telescopes. And this is an image of Saturn showing some of these satellites um, taken this year when it was very low down. So it just shows you what you can do. And you'll notice that the images are distorted. Um, they're sort of slightly elliptical. It's a negative image of an image taken with a colour camera. And this is due to atmospheric distortion, uh, dispersion at low latitudes. You can correct for this. But it shows you the Titan should be visible in high power binoculars or a small telescope if it's high up. And generally for amateurs, um, we can see Titan, uh, the next brightest Rhea, uh, Dione and Tethys usually. Uh, sometimes you can pick up a star and two of the smaller satellites can be seen sometimes with larger telescopes or by imaging. When the rings are wide open, as they are now, there's a lot of glare around the planet. As you can see, there's cameras picked up the glare and it makes the inner satellites more difficult to see. And in fact, these fainter satellites are much easier to see when the rings are edge on, there isn't so much glare. So potentially, this year is a bit exceptional because Saturn's declination is so far south. It's possible to see at least five satellites visually if you know where to look and conditions are good. But for many, many years, that's even amongst the professional astronomers, this is all we could see them as small star-like objects. And it wasn't until the spacecraft went that we actually found that these were worlds in their own right. And to discuss all the satellites would take far too long. But very briefly, four of the most interesting ones is one of the smallest ones, which is Mimas. This is about 400 kilometres across and was discovered by William Herschel, no less. And of course, its most famous feature is this large crater, which is named after William Herschel. And when the images first came back of Mimas from the Voyager spacecraft, of course, Star Wars was going on at the time. So this looked very much like Darth Vader's Death Star. Probably the most interesting satellite of all is Enceladus. And this is the one that is spewing out material from its interior and from these cracks in its surface and this material is going into orbit and almost certainly is the material that forms the e-ring and there's obviously a lot of speculation of whether um, it's believed to have an ocean and whether this ocean could potentially sustain life. Um, the largest satellite of Saturn Titan is one of the biggest satellites in the solar system it's bigger than Mercury it's surrounded by this dense atmosphere of nitrogen with a lot of methane lobbed inside of it. But radar images have managed to penetrate the 
the atmosphere and show that there's these uh, lakes of methane and other gases in liquid form. And of course, Huygens landed on the surface of Titan, brought back these amazing pictures showing the sort of rubble uh, on what looks like a seabed, but would probably be a sea of methane. And Titan in itself is a, a, a major of a major interest to astronomers because it may possibly have an ocean below its surface as well. But one other satellite is interest is this one uh, for amateurs is Iapetus, and it was discovered by no less a person than Cassini from the uh, who discovered the Cassini division. And when he observed this over a number of days and many years, he found that it was brighter on one side of the planet than it was on the other. And he speculated that this was because one hemisphere was much darker than the other. And indeed spacecraft has shown that this is the case. The leading hemisphere, the one that uh, Iapetus is moving towards, has got this dark material on it. It's got some very large craters on it, but this dark material is thought to be material that's come off satellite Phoebe, forming the Phoebe ring, and depositing on the surface. And this is dark material, and it may be that it's absorbing what little sunlight is in there and allowing the surface, the ice, to melt, and then it recondenses on the brighter side of the Iapetus. Iapetus is also unusual because it looks like a walnut. It's got, for about three quarters around its equator, it's got these very high mountains. It's almost as if two objects have been clamped together. And so it's very easy to follow the brightness changes of Iapetus due to this dark surface, but it's certainly an unusual object um, because it looks like a walnut thing, uh, structure. To talk about all of the satellites would take too long, but to finish off, I'd like to very briefly mention an event that's going to take place in a couple of weeks' time, which should be readily visible to everyone. I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, know about this, is that we've got a very rare conjunction between Jupiter and Saturn. These occur just under every 20 years, and this one is going to be a very close one indeed. And on the night of December the 21st at 5 p.m., uh, the two will be at their closest and the separation will be uh, six arc minutes or so, which is about the fifth of the diameter of the moon. They're going to be low down, um, you know, perhaps pick them up in twilight, but it's well worth having a go because this is the closest by far since the 17th century of objects and they lie down in uh, just south of Copernicus. On the actual closest approach time, we'll have Jupiter and its satellites and Saturn uh, very close together again. So this is just six arc minutes across. So any camera, any telescope, any pair of binoculars, if it's clear, if it is clear, should be able to show this. Um, a simple camera should be set up and taken exposure. There's obviously a wide variation in brightness between Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Saturn Jupiter satellites and then Jupiter satellites to Saturn satellites. So perhaps to pick up all these objects may require a composite image of varying exposures, but may not be as spectacular as, a, um, um, as say an eclipse of the sun, for example, but it's still worth watching because these only occur every 20 years or so. So the next one is not going to be until 2040. If you can't exactly observe on the night, the 21st, the two planets will still be close together. And this is a simulated view through a small telescope with a magnification of about 50. And this is on the December the 17th, and effectively Jupiter started to come into the field of view. They get close on the 21st. And by Christmas night, the Jupiter will be just outside the field of view. So even with a small telescope, we're able to see these two objects very, very close together. And it's well worth having a go to have a look at this. So, um, like I say, the next one is in 2040. So, well worth having a go. Saturn is... Uh, there is so much I've missed out tonight because there isn't time to talk about Saturn. It's, it's got a large magnetic field. There's so many satellites. And, of course, all the rings deserve some sort of greater mention than I, I've said before. If you are lucky enough to have a large telescope and maybe if you do imaging you've got in the seeing scope then you've got a lot of chance of picking up some, not all, but some of the features I've described this evening. 
But even in a small telescope, it's well worth a look. And a good four, five inch, six inch telescope is more than adequately showing the Cassini division and the A and B ring, and possibly C rings. So even if you can't see any of these storms, it's still worth having a look. And, and I've got a little bit of bias here, but I still think that it justly deserves its reputation of being one of the must-see objects in the sky. I think I've had my time up. Thank you all for listening. And if there's any questions, I will do my very best to answer them. So thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much for a most enjoyable talk. Uh, could I ask you to stop uh, sharing your screen? Yeah, I've just done that now. Cold brew, but it's still brew. <laughs> and uh, we're back to gallery view. So, uh, as usual, ladies and gentlemen, questions. If you can give me a blue hand, uh, an electronic hands up, that will be great. Um, otherwise, wave at the screen. Uh, we have got uh, 33 people connected at the moment, so I will have to scan up and down, <laughs> scan up and down uh, the views. Uh, whilst you're thinking of your question, Mike, I've got one. Going back to the Phoebe ring you mentioned, yeah. Yeah. Um, it begs the question, what are the origins of the ring? It, does, it, does it appear at the same time as the, uh, out of the protodisc uh, when Saturn was formed, or is it a later edition? That's a very, very good question, which I think nobody really knows the answer. The... The difference between the main rings that we see and the Phoebe ring is that, first of all, it's incredibly diffuse. It's incredibly faint. It wasn't discovered until 2009. It was one of the, I think it was the Spitzer telescope. And I, I can't give, I can't remember the difference in brightness, but it's incredibly faint, but it's incredibly large. And the general consensus is that this has formed over time. Um, from perhaps meteors hitting Phoebe, whatever the construction of Phoebe is, and just blasting off material, very small material, into orbit, because Phoebe's um, got a very low gravity, it's a small satellite, a couple of hundred kilometres across. But your question about timing is, is, is quite important, because the whole time scale to the formation of the rings is not known, but Phoebe, some people think, may be a captured asteroid. And therefore, if it is a captured asteroid, that ring would have formed much later than the formation of the planet and its major satellites. But the time scale against the main ring is, is probably uh, a bit different. And what the origin of the time scales when the main rings have formed is still, you know, some people have got ideas that it formed with the planet. Some thinks it was formed a lot later. So the relative time scales between the formation of the two rings is probably not well known. But as Phoebe was almost certainly a captured asteroid, this must have been done much later than the planet itself formed. Okay. I, should, I have got another question, but we'll let uh, somebody else ask this first. Hopefully it'll be the same question. So, <laughs> ladies and gents, I'm yeah. looking for uh, questions. Uh, Tony Morris, <laughs> can you... Tony Morris and then Roy Gunson. So, Tony Morris first. Can we have your question, Tony? Hiya, Tony. Mike, the uh, said storms. Yeah, yeah. Do they emit any radio waves? Can they be listened to from the Earth? That I think some people made an attempt, but I think the the um, I can't say conclusively. But I think they did search for them. I think the signals are too faint for Earth-based telescopes. I may be wrong about that, but certainly the radio emissions caused by what they suspect is lightning was picked up by Cassini, which is virtually on top of them. But to the best of my knowledge, I don't think they've been detected from the Earth. Okay, thanks. Okay, Tony. Uh, Roy, can you... I've done. Uh, basically, I was going to uh, just ask you a brief question about the moon Ipetus and its ridge. Yeah. Uh, I've heard somewhere about it being possibly a collapse string or it's the shrinkage of the the body itself that's caused uh yeah that that, I, that that is true i mean i've seen people who said that it had a ring and for some reason this ring collapsed on it and left all the rubble on the satellite that's a possibility whether or not it's had some sort of for it to collapse it needs some sort of internal heating i would imagine for things to collapse as well but um the one thing that we don't know, we see the solar system as it is now, but how the solar system was billions of years ago, we don't really know. And things could have been a lot different then. Um, but 
basically nobody's right nobody's really sure how this mountain range was formed but the ring hypothesis is is certainly one contender i mean we look at the the moon uh, atlas and uh, is it pan and they, yeah. they, they've got very uh, elongated equatorial ridges where they've picked up ring material yeah yeah you see, we, we honestly don't know what happened in the past. Um, I mean, I think most planetary scientists reckon that the solar system itself doesn't look like it did today. So how things were captured in the past and what happened in the past, I don't really know. For all we know, I mean, hypothesis is unusual also that I forgot to mention. Its orbit's inclined to the plane of the rings and the major satellites. So it's, it's about 14 degrees inclination to the other satellites. Whether... This is a captured object or it got moved in some manner, whether it was close, I don't know. But the ring hypothesis is one of the ones that is under consideration. OK, Roy. Yeah, thank you. OK, and, and anybody else got any other questions? You've obviously been very... Yeah. Very no, thorough I've tonight. Battered people to death, unfortunately. <laughs> the race uh, hand just gone up, I think. I missed it. Just keep waving if you're waving for a question. It's got Peter Lloyd raised. Oh, Peter Lloyd. Yeah. Go on, Peter. Can you unmute yourself, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mike. That was a fascinating talk. I just wanted to ask, uh, is it believed that the, the main rings of Saturn are stable? I, I seem to remember seeing somewhere that um, they were thought they might actually be a relatively fleeting object that might only last two or three million years. That is a very good question. And the, the it's just coming back to the earlier question from Paul about the Phoebe ring. There are two schools of thought about when the rings originated. And some think it was not long after the planet formed, but the, a lot of the people are now moving to the idea that we were more recent. And I use the word recent in terms of billions of years. And also uh, one argument for that is, is that the rings are incredibly bright if you compare them say like the rings of Uranus and Neptune are incredibly bright and some scientists think by impact they're icy and some people think that over billions of years impacts onto these bodies would darken them and make them more rocky. And there's also evidence of material spewing off the ring the D ring onto the upper atmosphere of the planet so making it you know it will disperse so it may well be, you may well be right, that over that these things may have formed relatively recently, and I've used that guardedly, and may disappear in, in you know, tens of million years or a bit longer. That's a, a current idea. But again, we don't know for certain. I mean, it's, uh, but a lot of scientists think that it's more relatively recent formation and they will disperse and degrade over time. Yes, yeah, so that's an interesting point of what you make about the brightness of the rings. The mm. lunar rocks darken at time. Yes, they at do. At time of a few million years, well, yeah. a thousand million years, maybe. You know. Yeah. If we take I the main, main ring system, um, they, you know, the A, B, and C ring, um, the, the feeling is they're made up of ices, but the C ring is, is darker. So, why is the C ring darker than the other two rings? That's another question. How the rings were formed, I mean, the general consensus is that some object got disrupted close up to Saturn and, and it could have been something a fraction of the size of satellite Mimas, for example, and it was an icy body and formed the rings. But like I say the consensus now is that it was more recent than perhaps when the, the planet actually formed. But why the three rings are so different in brightness, it, 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 nobody really knows for certain, I don't think. So it's an intriguing question. Thank you for your answer. Thank you. Uh, there's a question from Lee Cooper who's had to text it across. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for your question, Lee. Uh, what kind of orbital periods do the rings and shepherd moons have? Oh dear, that's a good one. I can't remember the numbers, but the... Oh, God, I'd have to look it up. I can't answer the numbers off the top of my head, but they... If you think like the, the particles in rings here are moving faster than the outer parts of ring A, that's the first thing. And it might be 10, 12 hours. I can't remember the exact numbers. And for forming resonances, they can form in various combinations. You could have perhaps a perhaps simplicity where the particle goes around twice and the satellite goes around once. So at that point, there'll always be 
if you like, in conjunction. But there's also other re resonances that you can get between all the various satellites. And some of the gaps that have been found in ring C, and I think there's one in ring B, have been tied to resonances between one or more satellites. But I can't remember, I honestly can't remember the numbers off the top of my head, I'm sorry to say. Could you give us an indication of where to look to find that information out? Uh, there are many books on Saturn. I'm sure it would be on the internet. I'm sure Wikipedia is uh, a good place to go. There's some um, books on, there's numerous books on Saturn. There's one very generic book by Bill Sheehan uh, just called Saturn. And I think in there it does have some indication of resonances. If you go back in time, the, the classic Alexander book on Saturn that was written in the 50s does allude to some of the resonances bet between Mimas and, and the Cassini division. But a good source would probably be on the internet. If you look sort of uh, Saturn's rings, I'm sure you'll find some of the resonances for some of the, some of the gaps that are in there. Okay, so th uh, the author's name was Bill Sheen again. Yeah, and, that's a uh, very general book. There are a few errors in the book, I'm sorry to say, but a lot of it is pr pretty good. So it does allude to some of the resonances for some of the rings. Okay, and I'm going to have to let Barry talk. I'm sorry to everybody else. But Barry, can you unmute your uh, microphone, please? <clears throat> okay, Lee. Well, we've given... Uh, Lee's just texted across again. And uh, yeah, the Sheen book seems to be uh, your best bet to, uh, it, to have a bit deeper. It's one in many books. It's a more yeah. recent book. And the only reason I know about it, I've got a copy to review, so I didn't have to pay for it. So that, <laughs> that's, that's a good thing. Okay, Barry's waved off. Uh, just going back to um, the rings and when yeah. and where they formed. Uh, Jupiter's, not, uh, Jut Jupiter's notable by the fact that it's got a very faint ring set, yeah. but it has this very complex relationship between it and the asteroid belt with its own uh, preceding group of asteroids, preceding and trailing group yeah. of asteroids, the Trojans and the Greeks. Is there any evidence of Saturn having uh, similar groups of asteroids sharing its orbit oh god i don't think so but i might be wrong but i do know i do know that some of the satellites saturn and some of the saturn satellites get the word right like the own in tethys have got their own trojan satellites oh um, yeah um it's late at night but they do have small bodies that are in Sorry. the sort of mm. trojan positions mm. <laughs> okay, whilst you're thinking about that, Barry's, Barry's actually gone online now. Yes. He's, yeah. he's gone and got technical help from his wife. So, <laughs> Barry? Yes, um, just to comment on Tony's question, I was watching a programme on one of the um, channels uh, called The Universe. Yeah. And they actually played uh, sounds from all the planets. Yeah, yeah. And, and one was from Saturn. Yeah. And I wonder if they... it's, it's amazing the noises that uh, come yeah. from the planets. Well, they do have large magnetic fields, and I just wonder if they're yeah. in that program and speculating, might be wrong, that the, the noises they're playing are sound representations of the radio waves they're picking up from yes. the location yeah. of magnetic fields. Yes. So, Thank you very yeah. much for your talk, uh, for your um, question, Barry. Yeah. Uh, okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am looking for uh, more questions and I'm not seeing anybody who'd like to ask another question. Mike, we've worked you really hard this evening. Nice, so I'd like to invite everybody to give you a big Mexican Swinton Astronomical Society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much. I'll try and put something stronger in this afterwards. <laughs> <laughs>